and welcome to the 214th episode of the Illegal Motion College Football Podcast. In Nashville, Tennessee, I'm the professor, Matt Perkins. And a quick fade across the Harpeth River from me here in the Music City, it's our own offensive coordinator, the coach, Corey Burton. What's up, guys? Um, yeah, man, it feels good to be back. We're, uh, it's the off season. But with football, is it really ever the off season? I don't know. I don't care. We're here. We're back with you, live and living color. Um, thankful to be back here on the uh, on the airwaves, potting with you guys. Uh, given the events that happened in our wonderful city, Matt. Um, fortunately, it happened a little bit further north uh, than the town in which we reside. So uh, we were fortunate to to. Uh, to only get a very mm-hmm. vivid lightning show at two mm-hmm. o'clock in the morning. So, um, you know, I, I volunteered a little bit today and, um, you know, ran food to some, some people that, that needed it. Uh, unfortunately, most of the people I went and saw, I guess had already evacuated and abandoned their house, uh, at least for the time being until they got power. But I mean, just to you just go around and look at the devastation. It's, it's, it's unreal. Nothing, you know, it's not like anything you've ever no, seen like, before. You know, and, I, I've encountered uh, you know, tornadoes before, but nothing that the left this much devastation. Cause you don't usually see tornadoes in an urban area. No, you don't. And, and usually like the, the, the worst that you see is some houses that are, I mean, you know, I don't mean to downplay this, but you know, you never see it hit such a downtown area where everything. I mean, there so are schools out in Donaldson that are just completely flattened like to the ground. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's it's very surreal. It, it's very real. So, um, but it was good to mm-hmm. get, get out there and volunteer today and just kind of see, uh, you know, just kind of see people um, in a better light than you know normally we're groaning about. You know, ugh, people people suck. You know, but not in this instance. People people are uh, and they're, you know, they're, and they're out there supporting delivering supporting food one food another and supporting. Yeah, I mean, all the organizations out here have done a tremendous job. So um, just wanted to mention that, um, mention that we're very fortunate um, to do what we do. And, and, uh, and hopefully, um, hopefully, you know, many, many more episodes are. Yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely. Come. Well, we can't get started without the third amigo in the second city. A man who is uh, helping Bernie lick his wounds after a rough Super Tuesday. It's our intrepid blogger from Big Ten and Counting, Josh Cook. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, what a what a turn of My events goodness. in the political world. But let's d- no one cares about that. Well, let's let's, talk about well, football. Um, major upset in the yeah. Democratic primaries, and uh, not so much of an upset, more of a question of uh, when, as, as opposed to if, uh, the Mark D'Antonio era would come to an end at Michigan State University, and it finally has. He has been. I, I don't know the actual terminology that they've used, but he's no longer running the program. In the past uh, five or so years, there have been many allegations of uh, sexual violence against players and impropriety uh, amongst both players and coaching staff. And uh, Josh, we know it's coach's favorite word of culture, but it seems that the culture of Michigan State had really taken a turn for the worst over the past couple seasons. But what will be your enduring memory of the D'Antonio era in East Lansing? Oh, well, I got a few. Uh, so just big picture, you know, bringing the program back, uh, not in a good, not in a good position when Saban left, you know, Saban looked like he was going to return them to their 1960s glory days that they had with uh, Duffy Doherty. Uh, they also had a good run with George Pearls, uh, but then he leaves and then the Bobby Williams era disaster you know, just John L. Smith era disaster. And, you know, Michigan State was a bad hire or two away from going the the route of like what we've seen Illinois or Minnesota do where just turn into like a 20-year malaise. And uh, he got them out of that really quickly, a, a nine-win season his second year there, sort of set the tempo. So that's kind of the big picture. In terms of style, um, you know, him and, and Trestle, like the hard-nosed defense, the, uh, some of those players that just went through there, 
it's like a grocery list of great defensive players. Um, you know, the, the Bulla family had all those. What, <laughs> Something like, like that. Kids, it seemed like went through there. Um, but yeah, you just look at, at some of the players that they've had. And then, you know, he had that run um, 2010, 2011, where they won 22 games, uh, seven wins in, in 2012, and then 13 in, in, in 2013. And then another 11 win season in 2014, a 12 win season in 2015. And uh, you wonder what changed. And, it, and they, well, they had some quarterbacks that they yeah, they had, a, they the had some, they had a couple really good ones that, there for a while. Yeah, and that's where it all clicked. So that's kind of the big picture stuff. And then, if you want just specific memories that will will stick with me, uh, first of all, the 29, 2009 season, Michigan State fans are really thinking, um, we went six and seven. Why does why does he care? Well, I got to see uh, arguably the best game. I've ever witnessed in person. Um, that was the year that Iowa won the Orange Bowl, uh, late October. Was that a in Ricky Stanley East Lansing Tate? went to the game. Uh, it would have been Tate back in the day. So, um, but the uh, so no, that was Ricky Stanzi. I don't know why I said Drew Tate. I was off by a few years. But, yeah, that was the Ricky Stanzi. Uh, that was the game. Oh, that was yeah, the season I, he said. Yeah, that, that, that's what I was thinking it, it but, was. Um, yeah, yeah. But um, so to keep the undefeated season alive, Iowa, uh, glancing at the game with my dad, and it's a 15-13 last-second score slant pattern Ricky Stanzi to Marvin McNutt. It was a thing of beauty. Uh, so many games I feel like Iowa has won on like a last second field goal or lost in the closing seconds. It's really about the only last second touchdown that I can remember. One of the best games I've seen in person. So that's a D'Antonio memory. Uh, more success <laughs> for uh, Michigan State. How about that 2013 team, the one that beat Stanford in the Rose Bowl? They had the memorable 10 point win over the Ohio State team in the Big Ten title game that, you know, everyone had penciled in Ohio State as like the, uh, the unstoppable force, but Michigan State found a way to stop them. And then the, uh, the 2015 one, the making the playoffs, super impressive. Yeah, they lost to Alabama, but, um, their their team that year was really good, and that was another game I saw in person. They on the opposite end beat my in the title 16, game, 13, a matchup on, of undefeated. Yeah, I think right. You it, yeah, yeah, yep, yep. And you guessed it, a last second touchdown for Michigan State, so they got us back that year. But um, r- returning to macro level stuff, kind of what does he mean legacy wise? Um, these next few years when everything kind of unravels and I know there's like some lawsuits and stuff still going. So we don't really know, but um, I'm, I'm reminded a little bit of another Michigan state coach and that's George Pearls. And um, for those of you that don't know Pearls because he coached there in the eighties and early nineties, um, this was a really good coach. He Won two conference titles, 87 and 1990, uh, slew of ranked finishes, and he left a tarnished legacy. Um, there, there was some stuff that unraveled about how, uh, you know, NCAA stuff, not big legal stuff like D'Antonio, but, um, but you know, he gets fired. They uh, changed the 1994 season to an 0 and 11, 0 and 8 mark. They had to forfeit all the games, and um, it's just kind of like, well, Pearls had success, but the end was undeniably bad. And I sort of have the feeling, based on where the winds are blowing, with why he chose to retire, why. There's these lawsuits going on, all the allegations with the players. I sort of feel like it's going to be a similar mixed legacy of, yes, he's one of the best coaches in program history, 
but there's always going to be the but there. And with the the smoke that's coming around that program, uh, it's going to be a really big but. And I, I don't think you can separate the legacies if what the allegations and the lawsuits have been pointing to, if that turns out to be true, it's, um, you know, that it's going to have to be always a part of the D'Antonio discussion. Yeah, it is, unfortunately. Well, Coach, I, I know that one of your enduring legacy uh, memories of uh, Michigan State under D'Antonio has to be that uh, 2011 Outback Bowl, the triple overtime game against Georgia. Yeah, that was one of those where, you know, you knew Michigan State was kind of that underdog that always that always gives you fits. They're always in the game. You know, they always – you know, they're well coached. Um, you know, they just make plays. And you got guys like Kirk Cousins, uh, Jeff Smoker, you know, those type quarterbacks that will just beat you if you sleep on them. And, you know, they were like the early 2000s Purdue team um, that just were pesky. Um, now, obviously, they achieved way more uh, because they won some bigger bowl games than Purdue ever did. But, um, you know, um, that one you guys went to uh, where they played out in the Rose Bowl. But, uh, I mean, that just that just showed me that, you know, this is a team that's going to be uh, a thorn in the side in the Big Ten for, for Michigan, Ohio State, Wisconsin, Iowa, the, you know, the, the teams that are consistently good in that conference. So, um, you know, all the stuff that's going on now just, uh, you know, you hate to see it just because, you know, just – you know, you just hate to see it because it's so bad. Uh, and I don't even know kind of where to go with it, but it's just one of those things where it's like, man, with everything that's going on, I, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this as a segue. I wouldn't touch that thing. with a ten, I wouldn't touch that job with a 10 foot pole. Um, and even then, uh, I mean, I don't know, man. I, you know, looking at Mel Tucker, uh, you know, I want to, I want to throw this question back to you guys. Um, given the whole scenario and how they came to land on Mel Tucker. I, I know, I know the last time we podcast, I mentioned something about this, um, about Mel Tucker officially turning down Michigan state. And, uh, he turned them down and said, Hey, I'm, I'm staying in Colorado. I'm, you know, I've got a good thing going here. I want to, I want to see, I want to see this thing out. I want to build it. And then like days later, um, you know, right after signing day, he said, uh, Colorado's been real. It's been fun. Hasn't been real fun. I'm going over to East Lansing. Um, so that begs to, begs to differ. I mean, uh, first of all, what do you guys think about how it all went down? Um, and do you think Mel Tucker was wrong in, uh, in leaving the way he did? And, and I'll say this before I turn it over to you. Um, you know, it never was his intention to leave. I think when he, I think he was being truthful the first time he turned him down and said he was staying. Um, They made him a life changing offer. I think where he was wrong was I think he probably said too much publicly. Um, It's one thing to tell your boss, Hey, I have no intention of leaving. And then they come by and make you a life changing offer. And you're like, well, I can't say no to this. Uh, And I think every boss in America would understand that. And I think Colorado ultimately understands that. I just think they probably wish that he probably didn't say anything publicly because it looks terrible. The optics of it look terrible. The optics of it definitely are not good. And I think that what, I don't know, I I always am very wary of coaches who take one job, leave a job after just one season, a head coaching position that is, especially for Mel Tucker. That was his first head coaching position full stop, I believe. Um, I don't think I, th- I don't think that's yes, a good look, and I, I think no, if we have not. learned anything from watching and you know being in and around college football for as long as we have is that c- building culture matters. And one of the reasons that even someone like Ed Orgeron has been so successful at LSU is he's built a culture that works for that school. And I don't and I think that. If it, it just if you're going to bounce around like that, it's just you're never going to be able to do that in the first place, and then and people are going to be inherently skeptical of you. Right. Exactly. Yeah, I think um, you know it. It's going to make it hard in the short term 
figure in recruiting battles, the opposing coach can really just go super simple and be like, look, man, he's going to bail as soon as he gets another job. Like, is he in there for the long haul? So short term, it, it might be hard. If Mel Tucker turns out to, to be amazing at Michigan State, all will be forgiven. Oh, yeah, for it'll, it'll all be the coaching, water the coaching world. But, it, yeah, but it, it's still a big gamble because the other coach that came to mind when I thought of leaving a school after one year was Yeah, he's the first Todd one that Grant. comes to mind for that. And Yeah, and he was at Rice for one year, won seven games, pretty good, gets the Tulsa job. He won 21 games his first two years, but no one really wanted him because it's like, is he there for the long haul? He ended up staying four years at Tulsa and then just one season at Pittsburgh before bailing at Arizona State. And, you know, he wins 28 games his first three seasons and then has two mediocre years and then a third season back in a bowl game. And Arizona State cuts cuts and run they fire him and he's out of the game for three years not even a positional job nowhere he was on tv for three years and i think a lot of that is reflected in the fact that if you hire him as a coordinator and your team has a really good year you're he's probably bailing or if you had taken a chance on him as head coach he's probably bailing we saw bobby petrino do something similar with western kentucky mm-hmm and bail to go right back to Louisville. And what happens is you're really given no margin of error by that school because they know that you did someone dirty. And if it doesn't work out and you get fired, no one really wants to touch you. So it's a big gamble on Mel Tucker. Basically he needs to hit a home run within his first two or three years Otherwise, Michigan State is going to be like, well, you know. Well, also, I, I think, Josh, that there's a real chance that they, they get some some serious sanctions. Yeah. And maybe he'll or, bail with that, like, too. So, I mean, but, we saw But with, saw with that coming do down that, the pipeline, I don't understand State. what the allure of that job is when you will always be, at best, the third best program, fourth best program in the division, whereas at least at Colorado in the in the Pac-12 South, I mean, it's USC, and even they've been eh, recently, and Utah is what you're dealing with. And the Arizona, so well, I, I, I don't understand I, I, the... I don't understand the calculus behind it. I know he's more, he's a big 10 guy. He went to Wisconsin and he poached Wisconsin's wide receiver coach, Ted Gilmore, who was uh, one of their stronger recruiters, <laughs> but, but they needed to double his well, salary in order to do so. Well, Matt, you're, you're legitimately burying the lead though. M- Michigan state has made the college football playoff. The big 10 routinely gets teams in True. the college football playoff. Pac-12 can't buy a berth. So from that calculus, um, the from that calculus, the sixth best job in the Big Ten is better than the second best job okay. in the Pac-12. Okay. The the champion the champion of the Pac-12 can't sniff the tournament. So I mean, like yeah, you gotta go, you gotta go if you care about that. But you're you're right though about the sanctions, and that's another risk that Mel Tucker's taken on himself. Um, maybe you know with Bill O'Brien, it worked out. He won enough games to parlay it into another job, um, but potentially it could be a real real grind to to keep that thing going if the sanctions or any sanctions that happen are, are terrible. And I don't I know. Co- the, a lot of I mean, unknowns right there. Coach, do you think that his, um, at, at least his schemes, will play in the very physical Big Ten? Yeah, I mean, scheme-wise, it's a perfect fit. Um, I think program organizationally, I think he's a perfect fit. I think he was doing a great job at Colorado. Um, I think all things within the actual football coaching realm fit perfectly here for Mel Tucker. I think he's a Big Ten guy. 
Um, I think he fits well in two conferences, the Big Ten and the SEC. Um, and I, I think for that and that alone, uh, he's a perfect fit. But when you factor everything else in, you know, red flags go way up. You, you're going to a place that's about to get damn near wiped off the face of the earth, uh, sanction wise. Um, you know, they're going to be irrelevant for a long time uh, with sanctions. Um, you're looking at a guy um, who has been a, is a career hopper, also. I mean, if you look at his resume, he's never really been at one place. No, he really long, hasn't. More than maybe three years. He was at Georgia for two years. Two years? No. Three years. That's probably the longest stint he's had. Um, he was at Georgia for three years. He came over with Kirby, left at the end of the 2018 season uh, to go to Colorado. Um, he was with Al- – this is off the top of my head. I think he was with Alabama for maybe two years. Um, he did a couple of two-year stints in the NFL, and he's just been bouncing around for the most part. Um ultimately. Um, and so, you, you know, the first thing smoking, you know, let's say next year uh, Vanderbilt comes up and well, he might want to get back in the SEC or let's say South Carolina opens up. Yeah. He's never spent Kentucky. more than three seasons at a school. Yeah. So who's to say he's not going to leave, you know, things get, things get rough and tough. Like they're probably going to, um, at Michigan State, I mean, it, it's going to get way worse before it even slightly remotely gets better. Um, who's to say he didn't jump ship for for the SEC? You know, there's nothing, there's no precedent set that, that says he's committed to one job. Um, now, I, I think them not being able to pay him as much as Michigan State pays him, that might hold him. That's probably the only thing, truthfully. Um, but if it gets bad enough, you know, money stops talking at that point you got to have some quality of life but man oh man you know i i I just i feel for the colorado program you know they were promised a whole bunch of stuff and you know i i I like mel tucker i think he's going to be good football wise i just wish he would fix some of those those other things that you know i don't know then on the flip side i i I see you know it's easy for us to talk about right but you know, $6 million a year is not being waved in our <laughs> face either. You know? Well, there, unless there's a sponsor out there that you wants know. to. And in, in that case, our, our phones are open. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd have a hard time saying no uh, to $6 million. We could finally buy the farm. Um, and we, we could. We could buy the farm. We could move. Uh, yeah, we could have Josh down. And we could have we could have a fully <laughs> live televised live streaming on maybe. the web. Ain't Live stream show. How about that, Josh? I like it. I'll, I, you better like it. Six million dollars, man. We gotta get. Our, we gotta give our fans their money's worth, especially Aunt Sally. She probably would pay the six million dollars herself. I mean, she's she's got some so powerful friends. Aunt Sally, you got a challenge. <laughs> there you go. Should we? Uh... You should have left the train going, Matt. Yeah. That was. That was I mean, the, the train's kind of well, perpetually going quite here. A, let's face it. True. Yeah. Uh, we've talked quite a bit about Mel Tucker, but not the guy going back to yeah, Colorado. Well, we, we, I mean, Carl, Carl Durrell Durrell. was. I, I think I would have named a thousand coaches before Carl Durrell popped into my mind as the next coach of the University of of Colorado. Yeah, he he'd been in the NFL now since. I'll be honest, I, I flat out forgot so I, he I, existed. <laughs> well, I did too, and I remember when I saw the news, I gave a really snarky yes, text to you guys. But but then I had some time to contemplate on it, and l- let's highlight probably his biggest strength: stability. And in the wake of the kind of the up and down nature of the Mac Mike attire years, one season with Mel Tucker, maybe stability for a few years will be good for Colorado. And what do I mean by stability? Well, at UCLA, he went 35 and 27, 24 and 18. Went four and four or better every year in the Pac-12. So competitive there. Took them to a bowl game every year. 
peaked in 05 with a 10 win season. It's not like a super sexy resume, but it's kind of a, you know, you're not seeing like an awful bomb of a year in there. 500 pretty much every season. Maybe that's what Colorado needs for a few years because part of the reason Mel Tucker left was the pay, but also he talked about facilities if memory serves, like maybe Carl Durrell's an opportunity of, okay, let's have some institutional stability for a few years and get our own act together because there's a reason on our end that Mel Tucker pieced out. I mean, that's, that's not, you know, bad thinking, Josh. I just, it, it's such a stale name. When was the, I mean, the fact that he's been out of college football, I mean, we've seen, I mean, we've seen Herm Edwards come back after not being in college football for darn near 30 years and be able to be, let's face it, much more effective than we, than all of us anticipated that he would be. But still, Herm Edwards at least has some name recognition. It's not like Carl Durrell, uh, you know, people don't, kids don't grow up hearing about Carl Durrell teams. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, I don't know. It's, but, it, it'll be interesting to see I the mean, staff he puts around him. I think that will be as telling as, you know, the, the fact that he was hired in the first place. Well, I mean, if he turns out to be this, this would be like the greatest coup in the history of football. But wait, wait, hold on. Um, I'm, I'm going to get, you're going to say if he turns into Pete Carroll. Well, yeah, that's, that's the thinking. A guy who has, no college experience. Obviously, Carl, Carl Durrell does, but Pete Carroll bombed out in the NFL, and it was like UCLA's lowest point, really, probably in program history, coming off those mm-hmm. Paul Hackett seasons. And they take a guy who is relatively unknown. The only thing that's known about him is he sucked in the NFL. And there, everyone was like, why the hell did they hire him? But he was really personable, knew how to recruit, and built that thing up. You know, maybe, maybe Carl Durrell is going to be super personable. Maybe he's going to go into recruits' homes and be like, we're building something, and just turns out to be someone who just had a bad – first part of their career but has a I mean great I second. hope so I I always yes. you know will pull for Colorado as a school as an institution I have nothing but you know uh good wishes for them but I, I just it's going to be really hard for me to sort of understand the logic behind it because it just doesn't make sense to me at face value yeah well here's the thing I I'm going to double check the NCAA rule book but I've never seen anything in the rule book that says all the players need to be human. So what I would just do is line Ralphie up as fullback and hand him off the ball and just call it a day. That would be my, <sighs> the, the problem is that I, I feel like Ralphie would just, uh, he, he might not be able to stay still for when they go set. He might just be perpetually in motion. You couldn't stop him when, when, when he, once he goes in motion, so what would that call be on the field? It would be illegal motion. <laughs> illegal motion. All right, end it there. Final podcast, we're signing off. This, 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 this has uh, been the Ralphie Fun been, Hour. <laughs> this is the last one we've ever done. Aunt Sally, you could mail that check on to uh, Matt Perkins for us to um, split. Yeah. <laughs> Might be good for a meal at Cancun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, so... Based on so, um, anyhow, uh, where were we? So, yeah, so in, any other topics in around the uh, college football landscape that intrigued you uh, uh, in the last few weeks? Well, I had, a, I had a stupid question for you. This is not news There's related. No such thing as stupid questions. There's stupid people who ask questions. Yeah, th- this, is, this is not news in any way. This is just a question. That I had for you guys. All right. So uh, we had we had some real bad teams. A couple. Year. We had, had a, yeah, we had 
we had several teams that put up a big donut in conference play. Yeah. Now, and I was curious, do you say bounce back or fire okay. the coach? So uh, the bounce back can be improvement. It can be whatever you define bounce back as. I'm not saying they need to make a bowl game. So I just wanted to run through the Ofer teams because I was looking at the standings the other day. And I had my list, and I was curious what your so, thought reactions were. I think the oh yeah oh yeah so those oh, people who win winless in conference, okay, yeah, I, I think the Connecticut one's pretty clear. They're done so they're, as, done, they're done so as a program. They gotta, yeah, yeah. So no bounce back. Is that unanimous? Yeah. Okay. Then we get down to a team that has already fired their coach and has Greg Schiano coming in at Rutgers. Bounce back. Listen, li- li- listen, man. I, if they can get some of that mojo that the Rutgers basketball team has going in that home, home court advantage, you know, I, anything is possible. So you're saying bounce back. What, what are you defining the bounce back as, Matt? Three wins? Uh, four, four wins, including, one, uh, including oh. at least one conference win. Okay. Coach? Yeah. I think that's fair. Four, I, I'd say four to six. I'm going to say bounce back, but I think they only win two or three games again, but I do think they are more competitive. For instance, their points for and against this year, 51 points for in conference play, 355 allowed. So oh. I, I, I don't know if the wins are there yet, but I think they show some signs of life. All right. Over in Conference USA, they had two offers. Over in the East, Old Dominion. And over in the West, UTEP. UTEP? Yeah. Man, it's tough with UTEP because... It's tough to define bounce back. I don't think they should... Because it was his first, first year this year, I think. Yeah, it was his first year. I mean, bounce back... I think it's just bounce up. Uh, I mean, they... they bounce they, up? Just, just, just win three games and be competitive. The same, same standard... Uh, Josh, you have for Rutgers. I yeah, guess. I can, I, I, I can concur with that. Any thoughts on the Monarchs? Yeah, pretty uh, much. I, I, I don't think they're hopeless. I don't think they're hopeless. No, they're I think the next team on your. I think I, they're asleep. I think they're a sleeping. Giant. I mean, they're in a, they're, they're in a, they're in a very fertile recruiting re, recruiting grounds. Um, I think of all the teams in the conference USA, they are in probably the second or third best recruiting ground. I mean, you have Boca Raton with FAU. You have two kind of rural schools in Marshall, Western Kentucky, Charlotte, Middle Tennessee, Florida International, UAB, Louisiana Tech, Hattiesburg, I mean Rice. Rice. I mean Rice. I mean Rice North is Texas, Houston. Like, I mean Houston's as 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 fertile a recruiting ground as you're going to find. Yeah, but their their academics are too too. That's talented. true. That's true. Um, but no, I mean there, I don't see there, there's some reason why Old Dominion shouldn't be competitive within two or three years, yeah. but it's going to take two or three years. Yeah. Um, here was a rough run. Akron went the double dip. They went yeah, 0 and, no, and they 0-8. are. Um, in the same place yeah we're, we're it's, going it's, Dunzo. it's Dunzo okay. with a capital d okay. all right uh one team that we know is already making changes because they have a new coach new mexico oh and eight last year two and ten bob davies last year i mean you got to give the new coach a chance so i mean obviously you give them three years in a place like that yeah you got yeah. you got, interesting definitely, team. definitely fascinating team they're for a team that goes winless in conference. They actually had kind of a not so god awful point differential, which is interesting. Maybe there's some pieces there. Um, the last uh, oh and eight, and I didn't do it just to be ironic, but it's Arkansas. <laughs> <laughs> another another team that changed their coach. I mean. What what they have to they've hit rock bottom. We've that's got to be established. But like, can they win two no. SEC games next year? They don't have the talent. They, they they can't. But I mean, okay, maybe I mean maybe they can be Ole Miss, and if they have Vandy on the schedule, 
you know. But it's I mean, they're recruiting pretty well. But so is uh, everyone in the SEC at for, this point. Well, I'm I'm saying for what they have been. Um they've been recruiting better than what they have been. They are a long term project. Again, um I'm not ready to bail on Pittman because a lot of people speak highly of him. Um but let's be realistic. If they're still over in year two, some pull the plug. Here's their SEC schedule at Stark uh, Vegas. That's a lost dog. The quote unquote, hey. the quote unquote neutral site game, Texas A&M in Arlington. That's a beatdown. Uh, dog, I'm going to go with a loss on that so one as well. Two so they're two and zero. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Uh, back-to-back Saturdays. They're both home games, but it's unfortunately Bama and LSU back-to-back. Bama lost Scott Cochran. They're taking the L, 3-0. and All right. <laughs> Homecoming. Homecoming a week after the bye on Halloween. Tennessee? Yeah, that... Hogs that, okay. roll, baby. At that, that point, they're 7-0. That's when, that that's one's when winnable. Game. Then they go to the Plains. Uh, that's probably going to be a loss. That's their first loss. Then they host Ole Miss. Oh, beat down Central. Yeah, I could. Uh, oh, oh, Ole Miss, then, Ole Miss at home could be a win. Uh, d- depending, but the, but the game, the, Ole, Ole Miss Kiff, fires Kiff also Kiff. could have that offense scoring fifty-five points a game. Yeah. And then their season finale, um, a team that I think is going to be hard to predict. At Missouri, that's going to be an, that 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 Missouri team. I have zero feel for at the moment. Yeah, I, to be honest with you, to be honest with you, I I think Arkansas, you know, is as much as I joked around about them being undefeated, but I have more confidence in Pittman than I do Eli Drinkwitz. Yeah. How Personally. about how about this to try to try on? Just like my opinion, yo. They open with Nevada. Let's say they they somehow win that game, uh, the, and then they they string some losses together. But then they beat Charleston Southern. And let's say they pull off the homecoming game against Tennessee. Let's say they um, they beat Louisiana Monroe in the good old penultimate SEC skip game. They head to Missouri with a chance at five wins and feeling like, holy crap, what a bounce back season what an improving year that that's not i mean no that is that the crazy is that no, the craziest thing you've not, ever heard but again i talk to you guys on a regular no. basis so i mean that's not even you know that, that doesn't <laughs> even crack, crack the top hundred yeah no but I, I think i think for that to be a realistic look at a true bounce back uh would be they destroy charleston southern like by 60 uh, they've got to beat Nevada by two or three touchdowns uh, because it's SEC versus Mountain West. Um, they've got to, they've, you know, they've got to show that they win that game decisively at, at some point. Whether whether they start slow and pull away or whatever the case is, they need to win. They need to win the the easy. They need to get the easy wins easy. Um, and teams like Arkansas don't get the easy wins easy. Uh, I, I know that sounds. It kind of sounds backwards, but um, you know, if it, it, Arkansas has got to prove. You know, any of these teams we talk about, they've got to prove that they can win the winnable games decisively and compete and give themselves a chance. Because late in the season, they will have a chance. Look at what Kansas did. I think that's. I think ultimately that's your barometer of, of rock bottom teams. Coach, you are predicting my really dumb games to play. Because my next dumb game was Kansas was improved, right? We all would agree oh, yeah. less miles improved them. Yeah. Do you do you smell? And I know it's I do middle, smell with the Rockets. I, I know it. I know it's early March, so we're a yeah. long way off. But okay. but your initial gut feeling? Do you smell a bowl with this schedule? New Hampshire to open up the season. Yeah, I feel like that's a win. At Baylor. Uh, Baylor, Baylor loses a lot, but and they have a new coach. Uh, that that that's a winnable game. I don't. I'm not going to lock it in as a win, but it is a winnable game. 
host Boston College. Again, win- winnable Another game. Another team that was rebuilding, yeah. That At Coastal be, that Carolina. That should be easy W. Okay. Yeah. So, so we've got two and some maybes so far. Host Iowa State. Mm, Iowa State's still kind of a I, – Iowa State dispatch, dispatches with Kansas just because of coaching. Okay. At Kansas State. Uh, it's a toss-up game. Okay. So we got two wins, three tosses. Yeah, sounds about right. Iowa State game. Host Okie State. Uh, what month of the year is that game? If it was October in November, 17th. I would pick Kansas, but because it's still in October, I'll pick Oklahoma State. <laughs> um, off to Morganville. Morganville. On the 24th. Yeah, Morgantown. Morgantown. Um, Whatever. Morgantown. Look, we're, we're out of practice. We haven't uh, had a podcast for you a while. Like your college towns, Josh. I expect better out of you. Well... In my further defense, we're playing a dumb game. And in my further, further defense. It's West Virginia and no one really cares. I don't have work tomorrow. (laughs) And I've had multiple Well, (laughs) uh, none of us have work tomorrow. Thank you, Tornado. So, um, uh, so, yeah, um, we're all in that same boat with you there, champ. But off to West Virginia. I don't don't see them winning at, at West Virginia. Okay. They're off on Halloween, which is really disappointing. I feel like it should be required for Les Miles to always play on Halloween. Um, <laughs> but that gives them an extra week to prepare for my favorite dumping ground, as well as Bevo's favorite dumping ground, Texas, at home, between the tracks. I mean, Josh, the, the, the single greatest moment in the history of this podcast is when you predicted that upset more than a month ahead of time. <laughs> I don't think Kansas won a game up until nope, that didn't. or after it. And none of it matters because <laughs> you nailed it. I did. But uh, we're probably not picking that one. No. Uh, um, Ellinger will, Ellinger will be out. a senior, I think. It's uh, – right, he's going to be senior this year. He'll be, he'll be a junior. It feels like he's been here since the Eisenhower administration. Yeah, true. So – Probably not. Probably Texas not. In that win column. How about how about up Texas to Texas, Texas Tech? Win. Ooh, yeah. so that's three. Um, probably not as lucky no. at Oklahoma. But then the finale with what has officially become the hardest team to figure out in the Big Twelve TCU. I mean, at home. Who knows? At home. Who knows? November twenty eighth. I... I TCU over the last couple of years has become um, erratic. Like you said, Josh, just the strangest team to try to even try and predict. So that was three. So it doesn't with a lot of toss ups in there. Gut feeling, Matt, it, it seems like you're not smelling. It's going to be really tough. It's going to be really, really tough for them to make a bowl game this year. Uh, you know, Coach, are you smelling a bowl game? Yes and no. Uh, I mean, part of me does because I think they're vastly improving and they will have a full year of their new system that they implemented, their new offensive scheme that they implemented in the middle of last year uh, with Brent Deerman. Um, you know, they recruit slightly better, um, you know, you, you got to think they're going to improve slightly at the quarterback position. Um, something that plagued them on and off last year. Uh, I mean, I just think they're going to play better as a team. I think they're, I think they're a year in with less miles. There's, you know, they have a full, full off season now, finally, and they'll have full recruiting cycles from here on out. I, I think the, I think the arrow's trending up. It's going to be tough to predict a bowl game this year, but next year it's bowl game or bust. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking seven wins next year, uh, but this coming season, I'm thinking five possible shot at six wins. Nice. Um, I had one last uh, dumb I'm game here to for play. It. Looking all the way ahead to the end of August, the week one games. 
there are some doozies on this. Doozies. Yeah. So give me a like how much oh, do you oh, want to watch the a, game a one to ten already? Yeah, a one to ten. How much do you want to watch 20, for the, just for the August twenty like, ninth games? Oh, all no, week, week one games. One games. Okay. I'm gonna run through a few of them. I'm gonna run through a few of them. August 29th, Notre Dame Navy. From Dublin, I believe. Um, yes. Six? Six out of ten? I'll take, it, I'll, I'll take a six. six. It's not like the game I'm most excited okay. to see. All right. Yeah, I'll take six and a half, seven. Okay. That's fun. A little thing that I like to call the Holy War. BYU-Utah opening the week. That's always fun, but it didn't hold my attention. Last yeah, week. yeah, because yeah. BYU is just uh, mm, and Zach, n- no more Zach Moss for Utah. Yeah, it's about the same, about a six. Okay. Big Ten opener. Those pesky Hoosiers. I mean, up in Madison. Matt, I know you're a ten, but you know, I you you, <laughs> you shouldn't use me as the the barometer for this one. Yeah. But coach, how about you? Say that again. Indiana at Wisconsin. Interesting. Um, I'm gonna let Matt. Uh, oh well, I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I'm going 12 out of 10, uh, and I'm predicting the start of the Graham Mertz era <laughs> on that day. Um, Gra- Graham Mertz will be starting um, for Wisconsin, and and the new passing revolution in the Christ era will begin. <laughs> um. Same day, Friday, September 4th. Same day as that Wisconsin game. Matt, the team of your youth against the team that was formerly your biggest nemesis. Syracuse Listen, at I, that BC. game, um, all, all, all kidding aside, where Wisconsin not playing that night, I would absolutely be locked in on that one. Because, you know, I think both of these both these teams have something to prove in what is going to be, again, a, a, an absolutely wild ACC below Clemson. Also September 4th, another crazy game. The Mac Brown 2.0, second season at North Carolina, opening up at the bounce house in Orlando with Nitro. The bigger question Central there Florida. for me is who starts at quarterback for Central Florida? Do we get more Taylor Gabriel or uh, will um, our, our favorite Hawaiian return? <laughs> After a year off, uh, following uh, just the absolutely devastating knee injury. Oh. Oh. Saturday, September 5th, the Manny Diaz Bowl, Temple at like f- Miami. Three. Like, come on. Like, no one wants – Miami's an awful team to watch. Temple's not much better. Like, no, I, I don't – like – you don't you don't find it at all interesting if the second season of Matt Diaz opens with a loss to the team that he's I mean, starting? I think it's appropriate because you know Yes, it's something to that it'd be it'd be fun to watch watch, but I'm not gonna to, I'm not gonna <laughs> sit to down that. to okay. I'm 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 not I'm not carving out time on my first football Saturday for Miami uh for Miami hosting Temple. Especially when, especially when at like you know that same day there are going to be so many better games. I mean, hell, I'm more interested in Arkansas State at Memphis. All right, all right. Uh, Going back to the Big Ten, two Big Ten games. Northwestern on the road in Mel Tucker's debut up at Sparty. Who they play? Northwestern at Michigan State. Those mm-hmm. annoying Coach Fitz teams to get. I mean, again, the like, style of play is not going to really, yeah. like, right. does not pique my interest all that much there. All right, fair I, enough. I, I don't give a terrible Terry Funk about that. <laughs> okay. Two coaches that the fan base went bonkers for when they hired – and the honeymoon is wearing off a little bit. Purdue at Nebraska. Now that's actually a little bit interesting. We could see some points scored there too. I'm 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 a little bit more on board for that. I'm like a seven and a half for that one. That one's going to be that. That's one I'll definitely turn into. What, 
Yeah. It it definitely depends on what game they're going up competing up against. Okay. Um, here's an interesting one for me. Would have been better if Chris Peterson hadn't retired because it would have been two coaches who wear khakis, khakis coaching each other. But Michigan and Washington. That 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 that's like a that that's an especially new coach for Washington. That's like a that that's a solid nine. That's a solid nine. That's the best. That's the best game you've described to me so far. Okay. All yeah. right. In the grand finale, Monday, September seventh, closing out the week one, and closing out my three stupid games that I had. Coach, your team, the dogs, going up against a team Ten. that we. A team that we love to talk about because we think Bronco Mendenhall is one hell of a coach. But you got the dogs and the who's. Virginia was in the title game. 20. Was in the title game a year ago, but they graduated some pieces. I don't know. We'll see. Matt? Josh, I'm fanatical. You are. I mean, know. Th- that's going to be a good game. But, Josh, you skipped over the two games that I am most intrigued by. Oh, no. Northern Iowa. No. Iowa? Uh, one of them, <laughs> oh. though, is does involve a team from Northern Iowa's conference. Ooh, Who Oregon. Is North State? Oregon. Alabama. Ooh. Wow. Is a uh, no a bear is going to be drafted by then? How is his his hand, hand size, size is massive? Though. He has he has I've... he has no issues when it comes to that. But apparently, yeah, Joe, Joe Burrow has has little. He has some. He has yeah. some Burger King he hands. Has... <laughs> yes, yes, he has Burger King hands. That is. Him, him you know and, what? Uh, when Jake I, from State Farm. You know when I was watching Joe Burrow last year throw about a hundred touchdown passes, what was going through my mind is he would have thrown two hundred touchdown passes if his hands were. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, I think I that is thinking. a good place to end yeah. the show for the evening, gentlemen. You didn't oh, tell Colorado, us the second oh, game. You said there were two that well, I Well, Colorado, Colorado over. State. Colorado, Colorado State's always going to be um, a, a game that, I, yeah, Rocky Mountain Rocky Mountain on, or going to be interested in. UCLA at Hawaii, uh, that could be that that could be fun Ooh. as well. Uh, I'm also here yeah. for Alabama uh, versus USC in Jerry World. Ooh. Yeah, that'll be a that'd good be one. Uh, and... I think besides that, I think that, that that's really going to be all of the, the big ones that I'm most interested in on opening weekend. But there are there is a pretty nice slate of games. Um, even on that Thursday, Clemson-Georgia Tech isn't awful, you know. Um, so we yeah. shall see. Well, I bet, we could, I bet we could probably identify the worst uh, game already. I don't. I don't know who does UConn play. Who does UConn play? I'll give you. I'll give you, a, I'll give you a. I was just is about it, to. Yeah, say they're playing UMass. The, the, the U- battle. For, the battle for the, the battle yes. for New England is on. <laughs> the, well, the battle for New Jersey is also on. Rutgers and Mom. Uh, but uh, I don't know. It, unless Hofstra's in there somehow too. I don't, I don't know if that's the real battle for New Jersey. <laughs> so, no, I think I think Hofstra actually well, discontinued well, football. Rutgers, so the third best. Yeah. They did. Rutgers is the third best program in New Jersey. After Monmouth. (laughs) And then Paramus Catholic. Uh, (laughs) Princeton's going to be favored in the Ivy this year, along with Dartmouth. So there you go. There you go. Well, I think that's going to have to do it for us, gentlemen. Wait, we didn't, we didn't, some, we we somehow didn't talk about the Charlie Strong Bowl. Charlie Strong Bowl. South Florida oh, and Texas. <laughs> There's a lot of vengeance games the first weekend between coaches and their former schools. Or uh, No, I think it's called coaches scheduled those games three years ago. <laughs> Charlie, Charlie Strong, Charlie Charlie Strong, Strong didn't make, make it to see oh, the game. Oh, that's good. That's... <laughs> he, now he's an analyst at Alabama. Um. So I want to tell you guys a story. Okay, story, story time, time with Coach. I'm here for it. Story time. Yeah. So get out your. No, I'm just going to close my um, eyes and let your voice guide me. That's that's probably the the best thing you said all night. Um, I'm going to look at memes on Reddit. 
Are you going to buy the petty file? <laughs> yes. <laughs> What's your story, Coach? Okay, let's go down to New Mexico State. Okay, you ready? Cruces. Jump on a plane. Las Cruces. All right, let's try to not get uh, coronavirus while we do it. Um, and Cruces we're gonna... virus? Cruces virus. Oh, I saw a meme. Speaking of memes, God, my ADD is blazing right now, but that's okay. Speaking of memes, I saw uh, it was it was one that was making fun of coronavirus, but it was uh, Karen oh, O-Virus. Uh, and and it, is, uh, it is claimed to have had three managers fired this, this week. <laughs> Look at those pictures of a bunch of Karens. It's great. That's a good segue into my story too. So, um, New Mexico State um, head coach Doug Martin uh, back in December. Not the muscle I don't hamster. Think we ever talked about this. Not the muscle hamster. Um, this guy's far from a muscle hamster. Um, he they launched an investigation based on a based on a complaint. Uh, based on complaints that they were getting. Well, um, they released a statement today and uh, Doug Martin was cl- cleared of any wrongdoing. Okay. So do you want to know what the complaint was? They weren't winning in, 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 in the zero games that he's been there. They hadn't won enough yet. I think that sounds about right. No, uh, yep. they are, they're, they're, no, no, they're think, being too loud think during of, team think meetings. Of high school problems. Think of high school problems. What what would be a big issue for a high school football coach? Hazing. Uh, girls no. distracting the players. Even more ridiculous. Homework. No. Um. no. Also, Matt, why did you say that Doug Barton hasn't coached a game there? Hasn't he? Has he? I don't know. <laughs> he's, he's I thought he was in his first season. season. I don't know. No, sorry, even worse. I didn't. That says as an independent. He's been there since twenty. I thought I was thinking of the new New Mexico, not New Mexico State coach. Regular, yeah, because they just got the new coach from San Diego State. That's what I was thinking of. That's regular New Mexico. I'm sorry, I got the wrong. um, uh, I I got the wrong school in the land of enchantment. Anyway, high school complaints. High school complaints. Uh. What's the only complaint you guys haven't said yet? What What do you uh, think? The coach didn't let them have their cell phone. Um, the, 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 they, no. They're, they're running too to much. The they have to do too much conditioning. No, no, think about things you would hear shouted from the stands at the games. Uh, shouted at the th- – Swearing. Um, swearing about what? The, the How much, how much they're, they're the kids are in the game. Them. They're putting, not putting their son in the game, that kind of thing. Yeah. So there was a disgruntled parent – whose child was not really getting to play. Hmm. Um, so Craig James has another kid? Yeah. This one got put in a, got this one got put in a closet as well. <laughs> he did. Um, so instead of just like letting it go, it's, it's college. Um, because it's a uh, it's a lawnmower parent where they're just gonna mow th- mow everything down in their path. Um they uh, instead of just letting it slide or maybe talking to the coach and say, Hey, what's my son need to do to play? Um, they started harassing and threatening all year long the staff. They, they were saying, We got friends that get you fired. Um, you know, they used racial slurs towards, uh, you know, they accused them of, of using racial slurs and, you know, mistreating all the kids. Well, they launched an investigation. New Mexico State found no wrongdoing. And now Coach Martin is going to sue because their staff was harassed. His wife and kids were drugged through the mud um, in this whole thing. Um, And uh, it was basically just a complete season long uh, slandering campaign for the kit, for the football team, for his family, for his staff, and for the university. So all because of one Karen whose kids well also like if you're if you're a parent like and your kid's not playing the way to get your kid to play is not to harass the coach it's not going to leave you in the good graces of that person like what I don't understand the thinking behind it but again like Karen's and Becky's are just like not kind of people uh, that I understand in general 
They don't understand mm-hmm. logic and logical thinking and, and rational thoughts. So it sounds like. And Martin is heading into his eighth season as so, Mexico. So it sounds like I should. Uh, Mexico State. Stop harassing Kirk Ferentz because he's not letting his son coach. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a great idea. <laughs> I can't say the same thing about James Coley now. He's moved on. So you're on your own, Josh. <laughs> oh man. I I don't even I don't even know where to go from there. So um I'm just gonna wrap up the show. Sounds don't, good. Be, don't be a Karen. Don't be Karen. Don't be a Karen. Um so with that, on behalf <laughs> of our own uh, offensive coordinator here in the Music City, the coach Corey Burton, and our intrepid blogger from Big Ten and Counting up there in the Windy City, Josh Cook. This is the professor in the Music City saying so long and see you next time on the Illegal Motion College Football Podcast. Get a haircut and don't catch coronavirus. <laughs> nice delivery there, champ. I know. That was great, wasn't it? Don't catch the cook. Care, 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 with, care with no virus. Sounds like Joe Biden at the next debate. I can't care. You know, you know that thing. You know, like we have a right to be created equal. You, you know, you know the rest. <laughs> no, we don't know the rest, Joe. <laughs> Why don't you tell us the rest? Thanks for listening to the Illegal Motion College Football Podcast. To get in touch with the show, email us at illegalmotionpodcast at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at illegal underscore motion and check out our Facebook page.